Ladies, gentlemen, boys, girls, geeks, nerds, fanboys, fangirls, and especially bat fans around the globe. We're coming to you live from Vigilant Geek Headquarters in Tingsboro, Massachusetts. You have reached the Vigilant Geek Podcast. I'm Andrew Puzak of Vigilant Geek Media, and with me as always, my comic book partner in crime. Hold the norm of Vigilant Geek Media. And uh, back on the show this week, we have wrestling aficionado and comic book fan Vin Scorpion. Oh, did you miss me? (laughs) You know we did. Uh, We got a great episode uh, for you guys today. Uh, We are going to review the latest DC animated feature, Batman the Killing Joke. So, (laughs) (laughs) um, we've all, we all just saw it uh, over the, you know, it just came out a couple weeks ago um, and... uh, you know, we all uh, have mixed things to express uh, in regards to the feature. Um, now, you we've all also read the source material, so uh, we are very familiar with this story. It's not a very long story. It's not a v- very big story arc. Um, v- originally written by Alan Moore, uh, who's, you know, uh, probably... probably- the most well-known writer within the comic industry. Correct. Yeah, easily, easily. He's he was basically the the, the man who uh, was able to uh, show society that the graphic novel medium uh, was not something just for kids. Um, and he did so uh, in the eighties with Watchmen, V for Vendetta, and uh, uh, From Hell, what have you, what have you. Um, and and uh, the art on that book, uh, The Killing Joke, uh, was done by uh, Brian Boland, uh, who uh, did a beautiful job on the artwork in the book. In fact, I've always said, and I've said in previous casts, that that is the best part of the book, is the artwork. It's absolutely gorgeous to look at. Um, but it was recently turned into an animated feature by Bruce Tim, who pretty much does all of DC's animated work since Batman the Animated Series. Um, oh, let's see, he did Superman as well. He did Justice League. Um, I don't think he did Justice League Unlimited, though, did he? Justice League Un- it, it seems like he kind of has, he's their go-to. Yeah. Uh, um, um, I believe he did. All right, all right. So, so maybe he did, and then countless animated features since then. Um, you know, DC's had all kinds of stuff out. Obviously, everything from Batman Under the Red Hood to some of the more recent stuff, uh, Batman Bad Blood, uh, Justice League War, Justice League Throne of Atlantis, oh, Batman vs. Robin, Batman vs. Robin, another one that just came out, I think, and last then year. And Justice League vs. the Teen Titans. That's right, I forgot that one too. So, so Bruce Tim is like you know Mr. DC Animation kind of, and he works he usually works with Paul Dini a lot of the time, uh, as well as Eric Radomski, and there's a few other big names too that I just can't. Uh, think of at the at this particular moment. It might come to me later on. Um, but fellas, let's open the forum here. Let's talk about what we liked, what we didn't like uh, about Batman: The Killing Joke. Holden, why don't you start a little bit? All right. Well, first of all, I'd like to state that I didn't enjoy Batman: The Killing Joke as a book when I read it the first time. Um, it was real short. Uh, it had some semi-interesting stuff about the Joker, like for the first time giving him kind of an origin, which I'm not a real fan of. I don't think the Joker should have an origin. Um, a lot of people will agree with you on that. Um, and then, and then after that, they they went ahead and took uh, one of the more popular heroines within the line and crippled her for the next 25 or so. Well, no. When, when did the book come out? 
Mm, I want to say 1984. Okay, so yeah. Barbara Gordon has been in a wheelchair since 1984, and, and until Gail Simone wrote her, right? Until until they rebooted her um, during the New 52, right? Um, and and Gail Simone wrote that awesome arc that I have in hardcover uh, of of Bat Batgirl, pardon me, sort of. Uh, you know, gaining her strength back uh, when she's able to walk again and becoming the Batgirl that we all once knew and loved. Um, however, uh, one thing that just really didn't sit well with me in this animated feature right off the bat um, was the fact that they uh, actually had Batman and Batgirl consummate. Uh, I didn't agree with that, and I'll tell you why. I feel personally feel as a bat historian you know uh there's a few major arcs i have not read but i've read pretty much everything from the late 70s up until present um batman in my opinion would have way too high of a moral compass to have sexual relations with jim gordon's daughter his best friend and his confidant and basically his his very first sidekick ever uh in jim gordon uh to have sex with his daughter, who is, I want to say, 25 to 30 years younger than him. Well, probably 20 years younger than him, at least. Uh, give or take. Give or take. So that, right off the bat, uh, didn't sit well with me. Yeah, Batman broke man code big time. Exactly. You don't, what the fuck, really? And not only that. Well, but, she kind of jumped him, which is out of character for her, too. Yeah, she wrapped everything off. She took off the mask and, like, like yeah, even, you know they made that. They made that like they, even when she was jogging through the damn park, they even emphasized on her tits and ass. Oh yeah, no, Bruce Tim was totally trying to sexualize her throughout the entire uh, feature. It was it was pretty damn obvious. I kind of did that during the animated series too, where they had this really weird relationship between the two of them. And that's not how it's ever been in the source material. You know, as far as I know, it's, you know, uh, uh, Barbara Gordon has always been a very conservative young lady, brilliant in photographic memory, of course, like uh, detective skills that rival Batman, Bruce Wayne. Um, but, you know, Batman has incredible restraint. Bruce Wayne has incredible restraint. If you look at his relationship with Catwoman, he oftentimes will not engage her physically uh, if she is currently breaking the law or, uh, you know, stealing or what have you, like, you know, it may, maybe if she's working with him, they develop a little romance and it spices up whatever story arc. But but he shows incredible restraint there. So Well, he's always trying to change her, too. So it's like... Yeah, he's trying to change so, her, So, and yeah. like... Like, when someone's, like, out there emotionally, you know, they're vulnerable, and Catwoman can sense that, and she takes advantage of it. Big time. Big like, time. If Batman has a moral fiber, yeah, we can't uh, do anything until you're not breaking the law. But after that, <laughs> we're going to outtop that pussy. I mean, in metaphor, too. You know, like... <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know... Uh, that's a that's a bit black and white, but that's pretty much how it goes with him. And uh, you know, you look at his relationship with Ivy, and he's always able to resist her. And no, most men can't. Um, and so, so you really think that he's gonna give in like that to Jim Gordon's daughter? I don't see it. I don't see it. Uh, I think it was put in there for shock value. I think they they had 30 minutes that they needed to kill in order to warrant this being a DVD release because people aren't going to spend 20 bucks on a 30-minute episode. Exactly. And you look at the killing joke as a story, and it's, it's, it's a quick bing, bang, boom. Joker shows up at the Gordon residence. Joker shoots Barbara in, in the pelvis. Joker kidnaps Jim Gordon. Joker does the funhouse routine with Gordon. Batman shows up and whoops his ass. End of story. Um, yeah, so, yeah. yeah, there's some filler and do there. it by the book. By the book, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, have to, he has to, we have to prove to him that the system works, exactly. Um, but all you need is a very bad day. <laughs> yeah, it's just one bad day. Just one bad day, the Joker says, that uh, separates him, according to the Joker, of course, separates him from... Uh, uh, from the bat or from you know john and jane q uh citizen in gotham um 
I personally agree with you, Holden, in regards to the Joker origin. I love the origin list Joker. Like, I was such a fan of the Dark Knight uh, Christopher Nolan film due to the fact that it's like you don't know this guy. You don't know where he came from. He just appeared um, out of nowhere. And, and in the New 52, the Joker was written that way. Like, Batman does not know who the Joker is. He knows nothing about him. And the Joker, meanwhile, knows everything about Batman, and that's what makes their relationship so cool and so creepy. Like... You know, this guy with the, you know, donning the makeup, you know, I've been chasing his ass around for, you know, so many some odd years now. And I still know nothing about him. And he's been in the bat cave. That's there's been evidence of that. I'm talking new 52 here. Yep, yep. Um, you know, he knows that I'm Bruce Wayne. He knows, uh, you know, who everyone in the, in the bat family is and their secret identities. How does he find this out? Uh, and how come we haven't been able to figure out who the hell he is, you know? Um, however, I, uh, I will say that if you are going to have an origin, the Jack Napier origin is, you know, the pretty much the concrete origin that everyone goes to where he's the failed comedian mm -hmm. and he, uh, resorts to, uh, joining up with the Red Hood gang and they pretty much use him, uh... Well, the Snyder says that the, his origin's a little bit different. Like, he's like this horrible, immortal creature. Where the, he alludes to the fact that that might be the case. In Endgame, he does, yeah. That he's been around forever, and he shows up in these pictures from, you know, the early 1900s or late 1800s. Um, and that's, a, that's an interesting take. Um, they kind of do that in Gotham. The, the TV series Gotham, where they had a guy named Jerome... Who was yeah. like a, his mother was a carny, and you know, he all of a sudden he just starts laughing, but then eventually he, he dies. But they always say the, the like the spirit of the Joker will never die. And I think I think that's exactly what they were going for in Gotham. Uh, I've reluctantly been watching it since the beginning. Um, they they like they have been trying to capture the essence of the Joker through different characters, such as Jerome, and also. Uh, Barbara, uh, I forget her last name, but Jim Gordon's first girlfriend, mm -hmm. who he marries in the comics, but in in the show it's different. Um, and she kind of goes nutty, and and you know does the the laughing routine as well. So they're they're without showing the Joker because the Joker doesn't show up until after Batman is already mm -hmm. operational. Um, they're trying to capture the essence of the Joker and how Gotham City can change anyone into that if if the, if they let the city do that, um, which is cool. It's definitely an innovative uh, way of writing it. It's way different than the source material, but it's entertaining. Um, I will say that, mm -hmm. definitely. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about uh, things we agreed with and things we did not agree with for this animated feature. I'm just going to go ahead and say some positive points here. The voice work, obviously, spot on. You got uh, Kevin... Some Oh, yeah, Kevin Conroy. Sorry, I interrupted you. No, no, it's fine. Kevin Conroy is untouchable as the voice of Batman. He's been doing it for since 92. And, uh, you know, he's, he's, he's done the voice in the animated series and then uh, uh, Justice League and then countless features. He's going to be on Justice League Action as well, which is going to be a new oh. Justice League cartoon coming out. I imagine it's going to be on Cartoon Network. I can't wait. That's going to be so cool. I've been kind of going through withdrawals from like a good uh, DC animation from Cartoon Network. And as I know they have Teen Titans Go, but it's just, <laughs> it's just nonsense. I can't deal. He also does yeah. the voiceover work for um, the video games. That's right. All the Arkham uh, video games, Kevin Conroy and Mark Hamill uh, do Batman and Joker for that, too. So then you got Mark Hamill's voice work for the Joker. He pretty much stole the show. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, some of his best work, I'd think, because the Joker had some pretty deep monologues in that, and he just killed it. Yeah. Um, speaking of Joker monologues, let's hear a little Mark Hamill uh, out of you, Vin. Oh, 
I appreciate the thing, but there's plenty wrong with me. <laughs> Spot on, brother. Spot on. But now my blood is in yours, so you have to find the antidote or we'll both die. <laughs> yeah, Mark Hamill uh, is just... I, I can't say enough about his voice work. I mean, he's a great actor, too, you know, for live action, but... Uh, no, he did a really nice job when he was the trickster in the Flash series. Oh, that was so cool how they... they you know, he was the original trickster in the... Uh, series with John Wesley Ship in uh, I think it was the early 90s they had that and then uh they bring him back for the CW's Flash series it was brilliant I can't wait for him to join up with the rest of the rogues I don't know I don't think it's happened yet um but you know seeing him play off of some of those other colorful villains too like Captain Cold and Heatwave and whatnot I mean that's just going to be so much fun but um so the voice work spot on the animation spot on uh i mean they captured the essence of the comic in the animation the way batman looked the way joker looked uh very similar to the graphic novel um so that was something i enjoyed uh and and in regard you know besides the 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 stuff they decided to throw in the creative liberties that bruce tim took uh, they stayed quite true to the source material, not that there was a hell of a lot to deviate from to begin with, but they stayed p- true to the source material fairly well, I'd say, in, in regards to even showing uh, Alan Moore's uh, Jack Napier Joker origin and how it happened uh, in the feature, which which I thought, you know, if it's in the source material, show it in, in the animation, and they did, uh, and it, it came out great. You know, uh, so if for those people that are receptive to a Joker origin and want to see one and want to see who, you know, who this guy might be, if he's, you know, you want to, you know, look at the Joker as an actual person, which, you know, I personally don't like looking at him like that. I like looking at him as like, you know, this I prefer my natural disaster Joker. Yeah, me too. It me just too. kind of appears out of nowhere and then hundreds of people die. Exactly. But for those that are receptive to the origin, um, that would be the quintessential uh, Joker origin to uh, certainly follow. And it was uh, depicted quite well in the animation, I'd say. But I like the, how the relationship is. You see how you know, both him as Jack Napier and Bruce, young Bruce Wayne, they both know how to experience loss. And they, they do it a certain way differently. So in a way, the reason why like Joker and Batman can never destroy each other is because... They need each other somehow. That's Absolutely. It. He's like, he's like, you can't kill me and I can't get rid of you because, you know, mm-hmm. you know, it's yeah. like you, you're, you're the one that pretty much gets me. <laughs> it's like, and, it's like uh, how it was said at the end of the, of the dark night when he's the Joker, uh, Heath Ledger Joker. He's like, uh, you can't kill me out of some misguided sense of self-righteousness. And I can't kill you because you're just too much fun. <laughs> I'm a master of chaos. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, that's absolutely uh, the relationship. It's explored. Uh, it's like a whoop yin, yin, yin yang. That's <laughs> it really is. And, uh, you know, Bruce has been accused by members of the family uh, as being dependent on uh, the Joker, and he's he's actually, if you look at some of the literature, uh, such as Frank Miller's Dark Knight Returns, he's he is, uh, um, you know, scrutinized for that by the media and by psychologists on the news and things like that as well. And the Joker obviously needs the Batman so that, you know, somebody can react to whatever schemes he's pulling. You know, yeah. he, he wants the reaction. He wants an audience. And the Batman's always going to be that audience. He's always going to show up, you know, and see, all right, what games is he playing now? But they're not games because he's killing people. But the Joker thinks it's a big game and he thinks that life's a game. And oh, like uh, it's a joke. Like yeah. uh, Batman, the last crusade, like, um, in that story, it's a, a kind of an older Batman, and towards the end of the line, he he decides that he needs to retire, but he wants to go ahead and pass on the mantle of the bat to Jason Todd. But Jason Todd is 
he like half wants to, half doesn't. And Jason Todd goes out to find the Joker himself, and the Joker catches him and with his gang, and he just beats him to death. And that's how it finishes. And it's yeah. just like, yeah, that was a great read actually. Um, and it was it was a good callback to uh, a death in the family. Um, not to be confused with Death of the Family, the new 52 arc that I love so much. Yeah, well, this one was more of a uh, a Dark Knight Returns prequel. It was a prequel to the Dark Knight Right, Return. because yep. after that, all of a sudden, the Joker, like, just, he was in and uh, locked up in an asylum again, and he just stayed there, and he got catatonic because Batman no longer existed. And then as soon as Batman came out of retirement, things, the gears started turning again. Yeah, he's like, Batman. All of a sudden, he gets his <laughs> cognit- cognitive stuff back. Like, all the doctors are like, it's great! He's cured! And then I um, and then he gets back to his old tricks. I love the part in Dar- uh, Dark Knight Returns when uh, he's on the Dave en- Endocrine show uh, with Bartholomew Roper, his uh, psychiatrist or whatever. And Endocrine's asking him, he's like, I've heard you've killed over 600 people. What's your stance on that? <laughs> and he just takes the. He's like, "Are these free?" And like he gra- he grabs one of the Dave End- Endocrine mugs. He smashes it and he slits Dave Endocrine's throat, <laughs> and then ends up uh, gassing everybody in the audience. Uh, like, oh, that, I guess that's his stance on uh, on that. So I like to see the Joker on a Jerry Springer show. That I mean, that'd be entertaining as hell. But I mean, seeing the Joker anywhere means murder. Usually, well, even like because a lot of people take this Joker worship too far, and they're like, "I'm gonna do what he did," and they go shoot up a theater full of people. Yeah, you get unfortunate things like that. That's the now well, that's the problem with a lot of media nowadays. Mm-hmm. But I mean, people with mental illness who have like really bad role models well that's that's the thing is the one thing that's actually a a, a negative impact on society that i think the batman stories um showcase a little too much of is they they romanticize insanity uh you got all these arkham inmates you got scarecrow two two face with the split personality scarecrow obsessed with fear Joker, I don't even need to say much. Uh, come on. Yeah, um, the Riddler with the superiority complex. Yeah, the narcissism. The narcissism. Extreme yeah. narcissism. And it romanticizes all this. And let's not forget Bruce Wayne himself and his psychosis. I yeah. mean, he is Batman and Bruce Wayne is the mask, you know? So, you know, he's fucked up too. And then uh, he's got that sick fixation that. He, he has all these suits, highly weaponized everything, but he chooses to go fist on on bone. Like, Whenever he possible, has to, yeah. He has to physically beat up criminal, criminals. It's so, he has to. He's so addicted to it that, you know, oftentimes you, you watch the animated series or you watch the Dark Knight trilogy and you see Bruce Wayne in these board meetings, you know, Sound sound asleep, you know, or or look at staring out the window, waiting for when it's time to be Batman again, you know, like he's a, he's addicted to being Batman. That's his addiction. Um, so the story itself, as good as it is, it's you know probably in my opinion the besides Superman, I mean they're neck and neck, uh, but Batman probably the greatest comic book story ever. Uh, but it romanticizes insanity a little too much and people can get carried away with that. And it's unfortunate because it's one of those cases where the few ruin things for the many, in other words. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, you can't give, if you, if at any point in time you're giving up freedoms to feel safer, you don't deserve freedoms. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, gentlemen, let's pick this apart just a little more. Uh, any other dislikes? Um, hmm. Well, uh, the length was kind of... Well, it was as long as it needed to be. It was pretty brief. But since I never really enjoyed the story that much in the first place, I guess it was about the right amount of time. Yeah, I, I kind of wish it was a little bit longer. <clears throat> and... uh but it's I like how the only the only thing I didn't like about it was the beginning of it. You know, I don't really care about all the filler stuff. Yeah, the with filler the stuff. Paris Had Franz. Nothing, yeah, Paris Franz. <laughs> Stupid name is sad. I love uh, you, Batgirl. 
I love you. So, and, and I can understand where like Batman was coming from. He was trying to teach her, don't get don't get caught up in the insanity. Don't be where I'm at. Because all his life, it's like he can't get over. Like that would have been her Joker, him. Don't yeah. Don't let it be personal. Yeah. And you know, it, but it's like I like how they because in the beginning of the, the original, you know, book, you don't see all that. All you see is him going to Arkham Asylum. He's like, look, we need to talk. Right. And uh, everybody knows when that start happens, that that beginning of that phrase happens, nothing's ever good. Now, especially with Batman. Well, okay, what are you gonna do? Punch me? You know? <laughs> right. Right. But I'm like on him being like on like physicality. He's in he's he's built on intimidation. That's all he is. In f- in fear. In fear, yeah. He has a you know superiority complex. I believe. You know. Oh yeah, yeah easily, easily. But I mean, he also is like the leading mind on mm. everything in in the DCU. <laughs> well, let's see. He is head strategist for the Justice League. Mm. He is the quote unquote world's greatest detective. Uh, <laughs> and he's he's at the epicenter probably of every major well, he's not at the epicenter of every major DC arc, but he plays a, a significant he, role. Yeah, it seems mm-hmm. that he plays a role in all of them. Like, you'll never have a Justice League arc in no Batman. It just I mean no, you'll always get your Batman, your Superman, and your Wonder Woman, and then it's kind of a mixed bag after that. Yeah, sometimes you get Flash and Lantern and Cyborg, but no Aquaman, no Shazam. Sometimes it's you get Shazam and Cyborg, no Aquaman, no Green Lantern. Sometimes Aquaman's there, no Flash, you know, what have you. Uh, Hawk Girl even was a member for the Justice League cartoon. Um, I, and I love the Hawks. Um, not to get too sidetracked, but yeah, you, you'll never get those stories without the bat. Um, if you look at the DC uh, cinematic universe and the way they're building it right now, now granted I haven't seen Suicide Squad yet, but I know Batman's in it. Um, they're building that cinematic universe yes they're building it on superman uh it started technically uh with man of steel but they're really centering everything around batman uh from what i understand have you seen the teaser trailers yet for what for justice league oh no i have not they exist Hmm. It's uh, pretty much it's just uh, Bruce Wayne uh, going to, and like having meetings with like with everybody like uh, meeting up with um, they show the part where he meets up with Aquaman and they show a part where they meets up with the Flash. Yeah, I saw that. He was like, I understand you know how to talk to fish. <laughs> <laughs> now, now Bruce is tasked with finding all of the other superhumans, basically him and Diana, him and Wonder Woman. Uh, after the death of Superman at the end of Batman versus Superman, although we know Superman isn't dead. Um, but he has that vision, I don't know if what you'd call it, when the Flash comes through mm-hmm. that portal yeah. in Batman versus Superman, where he's like, you have to find us, Bruce, you have to find us. Um, and you were always right about him. Um, I don't know if that refers to Superman or Darkseid or what. But uh, it might be dark side because he had the the that nightmare with the the parademons. With the parademons, yeah. And so, then oh, I think I know what it's going to be. All right, here's my prediction for the movie. Right, so okay. Batman goes and he recruits everybody together. Meanwhile, Superman's body is stolen by Dark Side. Um, hmm. When Superman goes ahead and he returns to power, Dark Side brainwashes him, and he's going to have like I've seen pictures of him with the mullet. Floating around the internet, Superman. Yep. Really. So what might happen is, is they end up in a situation where they got to defeat Darkseid. But in order to do that, they have to actually go toe to toe with Superman. I bet you're gonna have like Aquaman, like hitting him real hard with a trident and like going through skyscrapers and stuff. That would just be so cool. I hope you're right about that. So it'll be like more like Justice League versus Superman. Almost like uh. 
sort of similar to the uh, Injustice storyline where Superman kind of t- breaks bad there, but it, for a different reason, obviously. Well, I remember uh, Superman the Animated Series. Uh, one of the On the series finale, Superman has it out with Darkseid, but at the beginning of the episode, it was a two-parter. The very first episode of the two-parter, Superman is, is leading Darkseid's army. He's wearing complete armor, but he's carrying the flag with it, with his symbol on it. And he and and then after though, and he's like he conquers like this planet for Darkseid, and then he goes and he kneels before Darkseid, and Darkseid's like, like rise, my most favored son, and it's just like whoa. But then eventually Superman returns to his senses, and he ends up thrown down with Darkseid, and I feel like that's what's gonna happen here. If it is, then that's like the movie we all kind of deserve at this point, right? Absolutely, and if if that is the way they go about it. Uh, Zack Snyder would be a bona fide genius, and it would make for a great film. I think it'd be a, it'd be beautiful. It'd be absolutely beautiful. Um, but yeah, getting back to the um, the general point that I was just trying to make about Batman being the epicenter of the DC cinematic, you um, you have Suicide Squad, where Waller, Amanda Waller uh, of uh, Argus, which is the government agency that deals with uh metahumans metahumans yeah um she wants the bat and the only person who has had contact like face-to-face contact that they can get a hold of uh to figure out how to find the, the bat the sneaky little bat who's been uh destroying all kinds of property and branding people uh is to find the joker Hence the Suicide Squad, uh, hunting down the Joker. Um, you know, I know you guys are going to be seeing that today, mm-hmm. so um, let me know if I'm wrong about any of that. Um, that's more of just hearsay and things I've read on the internet. So, But uh, either way, um, you know, you're not going to get any of these DC movies, really, except for some of the standalones like Wonder Woman and The Flash. You're not going to get any of that without the bat. Uh, just like in, you know, comic book continuity, you don't get any major Justice League stories without the bat either. Uh, it's just, he's too important of a character, I guess. So, um, oh, final thoughts on the killing joke, gentlemen. Um, for me, I felt that the voice work was absolutely amazing. Um, it definitely brought Alan Moore as, um, it, and it made it more palatable for me. I liked it better in animation. Um, otherwise, uh, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of the Killing Joke anyway. And Batman acts really uncharacteristic and overly touchy feely in this story. Couldn't agree with you more on that on that front. Yeah, um, does not act like the Bat in this particular feature. Like he's not gonna laugh at Joker's jokes. He's not going to like like meet up with the Joker and talk about his feelings. It's just, yeah, I just don't. Yeah. I just don't see that. It's like just not the kind of character Batman is. It's like a group meeting at the VA. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, uh, I, what I liked about it is, if anyone is new to the Joker or new to Batman, if they want to like get an insight of how he is, that's the best thing to look. The, that's the best way to go. Because I know there's people out there like I've been. I've been an avid Joker fan for many years, and. uh not in that like sociopathical type way where I'm not gonna take it too far, but I look at it as, as Joker. You know, he's just he'll do what he want when he wants. No one's gonna tell him what to do, what to say. He's just like Stone Cold Steve Austin. Like no, you're I, damn right, I'll whip his <laughs> ass. You know, it's like I uh, think uh, Stone Cold and the Joker. Now that would be a hell of a crossover. <laughs> That'd be a great bring back celebrity death match on MTV. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. And I'm Stone Cold versus the Heath Ledger Joker. He's like, hey, I'm going to whoop your ass and do and have a can of beer. Hey, can I tell you about how I got these scars, Steve? You know, <laughs> I'll give you a scar up your ass. You know, <laughs> you know, but, um, but everything comes back Patch to it up with a Stone Cold <laughs> Band-Aid. <laughs> <laughs> Which again, WBShop.com. <laughs> um, but it's like, I like the way I like the way it portrayed. There's some things I, I don't like, but uh, a lot of it, it was entertaining. And Oh, uh, yeah. I look forward to it. like anything you feel like. Uh, the Killing Joke was always one of my favorite stories. You know, it's like I always, one of my ones I always read. I 
read it like a thousand times. I was like, when if they when if they can't they make this into a movie? Why can't they make this into like an animated series or whatever? And it, like I got what I wanted, but with the, well, a lot of anticipation and hype, you know, there's always a little bit of disappointment. Oh, I can only imagine how awful a Killing Joke live action film would be. Yeah. Well, it wouldn't. It'd be tough to keep it rated R. I th- actually, no, nah, it could be rated R. Um, it would definitely be something that'd be tough to put in theaters, though, because you're gonna have a lot of kids that are gonna want to go see that, and and it's not for kids. I mean, I am very glad this animated feature was rated R, especially with what they put in the beginning, because um, that's not for kids. Um, what I'll say about this animated feature is it it, it was very visually appealing i cannot say enough about the animation i do agree with holden in regards to the story it was alan moore looking for his next paycheck um he wasn't alan moore you know doesn't like writing mainstream stuff to begin with so he you know he wasn't even all that pumped about it it was brian boland's artwork that really brought that story to life um and really you know some of the most iconic pictures and panels comic book panels of the joker that you know you look up you know the joker comic book you know on google and and, and i'm sure you the first things you'll find are, are pictures from the killing joke um you know his artwork is just absolutely iconic and that was what made it in my opinion an iconic story that and the fact that uh that was the story where there was like the first real concrete Joker origin too. Um, those are two things that really made it iconic. Um, but as a bat historian and as someone who has read uh, dozens of Joker stories, I mean, I've even read some of the Joker stories from back in uh, the 1940s. Uh, I was able to download those onto my laptop and uh, so I, I, I have a very, uh, very much a, a vast knowledge of the Joker uh, and uh, the evolution of the character from, you know, 1939 to uh, present day. Um, there's so many other Joker stories that are just uh, so much uh, deeper and so much more fun to read, uh, just to name a few. Uh, there is, of course, uh, all of Snyder's work on the New 52 in regards to a death in the family, or sorry, death of the family, uh, in Endgame. It was just absolutely iconic stuff there. Then you all, you obviously have a death in the family, the Jason Todd story, which was much more brutal in my opinion than the killing joke, uh, where you essentially have a man dressed up as a clown, beating the shit out of a miner, dressed in a costume with a crowbar, and then blowing him up. It's absolutely, it's just crazy violent. Um, Yeah, like uh, hitting a freaking uh, thumbtack with a sledgehammer. Yeah, (laughs) and then you have, you know, the the Man Who Laughs, which is uh, the story of when Batman and Joker first met, um, which is very good as well. Uh... Where you get to you get to really see uh, the first major time uh, Batman and Jim Gordon team up as a duo. Uh, there's just there's so many incredible Joker stories out there. Uh, the Killing Joke has the fame it has, in my opinion, due to the origin and due to the artwork. But besides that, it's I'm sorry, Alan Moore. I know you don't give a shit, anyways. But it's not it's nothing special. Um, so we have a little bit of time where I actually would love to go around the table, guys, and uh, let's discuss our favorite representations of the Joker. Um, now, I know Holden and I are going to say Mark Hamill, um, but Mark Hamill aside, let's 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 take Mark Hamill and put him aside. He is untouchable. He is my favorite, but there's been countless others. Um, yeah, they've all been played uh, a little bit, well, quite differently. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. So, hold on, let's start with you. What, what who is your favorite Joker, and why? Uh, I'm gonna go with Heath Ledger. I mean, it's not that I don't enjoy the other incarnations of the Joker. Um, it's just that it just fits so well for the type of story that they were trying to tell. 
Um, and I mean, that was a, l- a really long movie too, The Dark Knight. Oh yeah, and and it's too easy. I could probably sit in that for two hours straight, easy. Oh yeah, and the- it was so well written, and it's uh, the only thing that that uh, <laughs> that kind of rubs me the well, not rubs me the wrong way. Just kind of uh, like just the people doing the Joker impression. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the he ledger one with the scars all the time, <laughs> constantly. Ha ha ha! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh, oh. Uh. Well, everybody knows who I like. Heath Ledger, you know, he epitomizes like the best Joker. Uh, just the way he's, even when he used his own little mannerisms that he did, you know, when licking his mouth and all that kind of stuff, that's like a nervous tick he had. So he even engulfed himself into the Joker character. Oh, yeah. You know, I, I haven't seen Jared Leto's version yet, um, but <clears throat> it doesn't really matter to me. I'll always be a Heath Ledger fan. Um, Like, I became a fan of that so much, I can even, you know, I did his impression. I always do it most of the time because it's kind of ironic that I do have a big scar. So, <laughs> like, so I'm like, can I tell you about these scars? <laughs> Let me show you how I got them. My dad <laughs> was a drinker and a fiend. One day he came home crazy than usual. Mom went for the kitchen knife. Dad didn't like that. Not one bit. <laughs> he sees me looking at a far. He looks at me and says, "Why so serious?" That's enough. And Let's <laughs> put a smile on <laughs> that face. <laughs> and why so serious? <laughs> <laughs> now we're gonna have tryouts. Tryouts. <laughs> Make it quick. Now our outfit is small, but we have a lot of room for aggressive expansion. So who'd like to join our team? <laughs> we'll have tryouts. <laughs> uh, we could go on and on. Um, one little bit about Ledger. Um, not to get too morbid on you guys, but uh, I read uh, an article, a very interesting article, about his death and uh, things that transpired uh, leading up to that. And uh, apparently when Ledger was, uh, you know, immersing himself in the role, he kept a journal, a Joker journal, where he was taking lots of pictures of himself with the makeup, lot, you know, cutting and pasting lots of other Joker pictures. And then uh, it got so bad that he ended up pasting pictures of the Joker and pictures of clowns like all over his hotel room and he was just doing a ton of drinking and taking a ton of benzodiazepines and I mean we all know those those don't mix well um, so he even, he even blackened out the room oh I didn't know that yeah, he darkened it out he pretty much secluded himself and he just engulfed himself so much that it pretty much drove him over to the breaking point what is it about preparing for this role that drives people to the fucking edge well, well, except Jack Nicholson. <laughs> Fucking Jack, well, Jack Nicholson's like, what the fuck's this kid's problem? Jack Nicholson was just Jack Nicholson in The Joker. Yeah. Well, well, it's funny you guys bring up Nicholson because Nicholson warned him. Nicholson said, be fucking careful with this role. This role, like, fucked with me, mm-hmm. you know? And for it to fuck with, like, Jack Nicholson. Who's the in fucking, the fucking Shining. Yeah, I mean, he, he hacks up a bunch of people in The Shining, no problem. He and, goes fucking ape shit in that movie. And J.P. McMurphy in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Yeah, and then One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Of, of course, um, you know, and, he's and Danny back. DeVito is in it too, who ends up being the penguin. And yeah, I know, <laughs> I, I, I love it, I love it, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I lo- um, not to get sidetracked, but I love the part in Batman Returns when like all the uh, the public relations people are trying to prepare him for his campaign for mayor, and he ends up biting off the guy's fucking nose. <laughs> Could be worse, I can be bleeding from my nose. He's like, ah, um, chomp. <laughs> Danny DeVito was the perfect penguin too, but I don't, uh, I don't know if he was typecast because he's short. Yeah, yeah, I think he was. Yeah, that's messed up. I don't think he even cared. I love the part too when he's trying to hit on Catwoman. The lousy minx. She's sending all the wrong signals. <laughs> Freaking chokes her to death with both an umbrella. Yeah, it's so funny. But uh, Catwoman having nine lives in that movie. <laughs> I, was, I was waiting for Locker to come out of the woodwork. From Taxi. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no shit. Um, that's some old school DeVito right there. Man, yeah. what, if, what if they called up Tim Burton and was like, would you like to make another Batman movie with Michael Keaton? Ooh. 
Michael Keaton is 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 so old and wrinkly now, though. Well, well could they do the story a, where he so? trained another Batman? That doesn't Batman, matter. They got stunt doubles. You trained another Batman. Like didn't they do that once before? When he had like he was retired, but he had another guy dress him as Batman. Oh, Batman, Batman Beyond. Beyond. Yeah, yeah Batman with Beyond. Uh, Terry McGinnis. Is that the name? McGillis? Yeah. McGinnis? No, it's McGinnis. Terry McGinnis uh, played Batman, Be- or is Batman Beyond. Pardon me. Yeah. Um, Batman Beyond, that would make a great live yeah, and action. And you have Michael Keaton as the Batman, because out of any Batman, he's my favorite. I've seen, and it's funny you say that, because I've seen a lot of uh, fan art on the internet with showing showcasing Keaton, the old, you know, current day Keaton, uh, with, you know, Batman Beyond, you know, uh, and, and I think that would be really cool. I'd see it. Yeah, absolutely. That would make a great live action. Um, real quick, I'm going to say that even though I have a lot of love for Ledger, and I actually have a lot of love for Cesar Romero, even though he was super campy. Um, <laughs> well, Batman 66 was a straight-up campy... All the, I, rem- I watched the uh, the Batman movie, the the 66 movie. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, um, love it. Wicked campy. Um, but very silly, very campy, and actually a lot of the uh, famous Batman writers like Denny O'Neill actually, like really scorn that show because it 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 took Batman away from his dark roots and sort of made him silly in the comics for a while where they're doing a lot of silly things with Batman and a lot of his rogues but it's um, it's so influential though it, it intru- yeah. it introduced Batman to the general public mm-hmm. it was the tone of the show was for kids so all of a sudden you get all these kids who like Batman then you they grow up reading Batman, and now Batman's kind of matured with his audience. That's that's all like it, my childhood. Exactly, and it's carried this same cult fan base. It's not even a cult; it's like everyone loves, knows, and loves Batman. Um, but yeah, it, it, it you know, in many ways, it definitely did start with that television show. Um, and I do have love for Caesar Romero's portrayal. I mean, you know, it, it was silly, but it was it was fun. But I'm gonna have to go with Nicholson. Um, I just. You know, it was Jack Nicholson's take on the Joker, but I thought that it stayed true to the classic Joker. That Joker from the 1940s and 50s, you know, who'd wear, you know, the the purple hat and stuff. And, and, and uh, you know, it's tough for me really to describe, but, you know, the vintage Joker that, that, you, that you'd see... Uh, um, from the comics, like I just felt like Jack Nicholson portrayed that so well. Um, now instead of the Red Hood gang, they did the origin. They did the Jack Napier origin in that, um, which is you know take it or leave it. You're, you're either a, a Joker origin guy or a non-Joker origin guy. Um, but instead of the Red Hood gang, they had Carl Grissom's mob gang or whatever. And I didn't. I also didn't really like how Commissioner Gordon was more of a spectator than than Batman's partner. You know, in in crime fighting. But uh, Jack Nicholson stole that show. You know, like he was just he was, in my opinion, he was awesome. And he he did like sort of like unnecessary destructive things, like when he's in the museum, like fucking up all the artwork it's like there's no reason for that but the joker does random things like that to say hey the joker was here in fact i think that was on one of the paintings joker was here yeah he, yeah. <laughs> he did it he actually he wrote it himself it was like back in the weather where back during the what, world war ii or something like that so somebody was here yeah that's pretty what joker was here yeah oh, it's um black and kilroy. White. kilroy yeah kilroy, kilroy was here. Yeah. so it was a little spit on that but it was it was funny he's like I like I like like when I saw the 1989 version of Batman and I saw him as the Joker, I was like, "There's no one can get any better than that." And then I, but it's like different takes, like you said, it's more originality. Yeah, sure. And then you know Heath Ledger came on the scene in uh, the late 2000, I think 2008, and uh, and, how, and how dejected where we were about that because we see I'm like Heath Ledger, he was just on Brokeback Mountain, he played on Ten Things I Hate About You. How yeah, can you be a Joker? A Knight's Tale. Like, yeah, a Knight's Tale. I'm like, how can you take him seriously? And I watched. I was like, damn. I'm like, that is awesome. Well, he, he was really good in The Patriot. Too. Yeah, yeah, he was, yeah. yeah. Another good fair. Another, another good, good yeah. another good one. Um, but you know, I equate that to Eisenberg's portrayal of Luthor. I was so disappointed when I heard about the casting, and and it ended up I thought he did a great job. I think he would make a better Riddler. 
Oh, he, he'd make a phenomenal Riddler. Yeah. Um, but, you know, he made a great Luther. I mean, if you look at the DCU and you look at, like, the smartest villains, like the Riddler and Luthor... Luthor is smarter, obviously, mm-hmm. but I mean, uh, Riddler's right up there as one of the smartest villains. I mean, he is Batman's intellectual challenge. Gene, Hack- Gene Hackman so. was my favorite Luthor. Oh, he was the best. No <laughs> one will ever be better than, than Gene Hackman. He was the perfect Luthor. He's like such a coward, you know? It was so great. The greatest criminal mind of all time. Yeah, <laughs> even team up with like Richard Pryor. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, Superman, Superman actually, no, three. Luthor, actually, Luthor wasn't in there. Was another guy. That's right. Luthor was only, was in the first two, and then he came back in Quest for Peace. Yeah, yeah, that's right. No, what was it, Richard Pryor? Yeah, he was making like kryptonite cigarettes or something. He, he, or, he what he did was he took like um he worked in computers, he got a job working computers, and he took like every cent that's coming out, and he made like billions, like millions of dollars, and. They realize that he's stealing from the company, and the guy realizes it, and he goes, "Okay, and then hire me to make a supercomputer." And right, and then they had that supercomputer, and like it's just funny to me how it just engulfed that lady and just made her turn into a, like a computer herself. Itself, <laughs> it was alive or some shit. Like it was that. a it was a very silly kind of bad movie. The first two Superman movies were were on point, I think. Uh, you got the first Superman, Gene Hackman is just a flawless Lex Luthor. And then, uh, you know, I thought when the Kryptonians came mm-hmm. in Superman 2, uh, General Zod, I mean, I, that was cool, too. Um, you know, but then after that, uh, and we discussed this with Mark Gallagher back in season one when we talked about comic book movies, uh, how uh, Richard Donner uh, wasn't directing. Uh, yeah, he, he filmed, like, something like 90% of it, and then... He filmed he filmed ninety like ninety percent of uh, the of the second movie, and then they changed to a different film company mm-hmm. called Canon, and they got rid of him, and then they had to come up with like, you know, fifty one percent of the of new footage, and that's where you get like the stupid S coming off of his chest and things like stupid things like that, because um, once again, Richard Donner, phenomenal filmmaker take Richard Donner away and then you you start getting crap like that and Mm -hmm. it gets worse and worse as the series goes on but I mean uh, first two were solid uh, but that's pretty funny though when it's like hokey oh he called me in super saran wrap yeah (laughs) I know like it's like come on (laughs) but uh, yeah um, I think this was a really fun cast we did today Um, Mm -hmm. I love talking Joker so uh, you know this was this was just, you know, peaches and cream for me. Um, but I want to thank all you listeners out there for uh, listening in this week. Go see The Killing, or go rent or buy The Killing Joke if you haven't seen it yet. It is worth watching. Um, very entertaining. Very awesome animation. Uh, my name is... Oh, you know what? Before I say my name, although you already know it, uh, let's do a few plugs. Uh, we just want to mention that if you have not subscribed to our YouTube page, please do so. Like our videos and comment. Also visit our blog at thevigilantgeek.blogspot.com. Lots of great content on there. Articles, uh, indie book reviews, uh, neat things. Lots of neat pictures and things. We and actually uh, a new segment that uh, Vin is uh, heading up here uh, called the Scorpions Den in regards to pro wrestling. Uh, that's up on the blog right now, so you're gonna want to check that out too. Uh, Vin, I uh, just real quick. Now I know you met uh, some serious WWE and pro re- other pro wrestling superstars at McCoy Stadium uh, a few weeks back in Pawtucket. Um, I don't know if you have a few things you want to add about that or save that for a different episode. Well, or? well that's going to be what the um, the Scorpion Zen is going to be because you, okay. you pretty much said it um, in the vlog that in the blog I, I, as you know as you said um, that way we will get more, a little bit more in detail. You know I. <clears throat> You no, know, just a thing. It was like me being Finn Scorpion. I got to meet the idol, the icon Sting, who I've looked up to ever since. I watched more WCW than I watched WWE back in the day. Right. And how appropriate is that? The yeah. Scorpion gets to meet Sting. I told him that, too. I told, <laughs> I, I, told him that, I told him that, too. I'm like, you've been a very big influence on me ever since when you were just a you know blonde guy from Venice Beach, California, to every yeah. man's, to go into every man's nightmare, being the, you know, the, the vigilante Sting, which is more of the WWE's take on it. But I when he did that... No, change to his character was amazing. 
right and, right and, and just like to meet him face to face you know i was just like i was like in awe way cool and we got some really cool pictures of uh vin with uh sting and then some of some other uh big name superstars up on the blog so once again go to the vigilant geek.blogspot.com also we're on facebook www.facebook.com slash the vigilant geek or just look us up the vigilant geek on facebook you'll find us uh we're also on twitter at the vigilant geek and you can reach holden at holden jack orm uh and uh i think uh that's pretty much what we have going on on the internet at, at this point in time oh i suppose uh if you go to the blog, um, if, 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 you know, you don't want to listen to us on YouTube, you can also listen to us on fans.fm. You can find the link on the blog, too, for uh, all the podcast episodes there. Um, so, guys, I want to thank you all for joining me today for this epic discussion on The Killing Joke. I'm Andrew Puzak of Vigilant Geek Media. And with me, as always... Hold an arm of Vigilant Geek Media... And as well, we want to thank Vin Scorpion for being back on the show. He's one of our big analysts here at Vigilant Geek Media. Thank you very much, Vin, for being on again. So always my pleasure because I'm glad you said list at the at the end of it because I always said I thought you were going to call me a big anal. (laughs) (laughs) I'm here weak, folks. (laughs) And as always, stay stay vigilant. vigilant.